thank you very much. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for inviting me here. Thank you for all of you who stayed to, to witness this presentation and participate in the discussion. I want to emphasize that um, I'm not presenting my research, as my research is in literary studies, uh, mainly in Ukrainian and comparatively in Russian literature. But these are questions that I face every day when, when I engage in, in, in activities such as Kritika. Uh, and I can imagine that a lot of you also face these questions um, every day in your activities, trying to combine a certain kind of activism, in quotation marks, and your activities as scholars. Um, what does it usually mean? I'm, uh, this is just a photograph um, from uh, the press conference of um, a conference organized uh, shortly after Euromaidan, uh, of which we were co-organizers. The, the name of the conference was Ukraine uh, Thinking Together, and uh, Timothy Snyder no, it was, it was in, in Ukrainian. That was the Ukrainian title. Um, the English title was Ukraine Thinking Together. And it was um, initiated by Timothy Snyder, by the uh, I, IWM in, in uh, Vienna, and also by us as local uh, organizers. And so the idea is, or the question is, uh, how do we as intellectuals, as scholars, uh, contribute to the events that are uh, going on in Ukraine, to the changes uh, in the society. Um, so talking in general about public engagement, we have to consider certain views that are that dominate the, um, the discussion. First of all, that in the academia, we still have to deal with a generally negative view of the public engagement of scholars. Uh, secondly, um, uh, often the view is that fundamental research and activism, in quotation marks, are incompatible. Uh, furthermore, usually uh, scholarship is uh, limited to a certain imagined, sp imagined space, and so public space is not where, where, where research apparently is happening. So usually a lab, university, archive, or library are those spaces, the typical spaces. Um, in the society, and I'm, I'm, kind of, I'm trying to include both the Western society and the Ukrainian society, um, there is uh, equally also a generally negative view of the intellectual. So this is basically a heritage that we have to deal with, and I think most of us are aware of that. What does it mean? It means usually that there are stereotypes such as impracticality, uh, nitpicking, right, inadequacy to the present needs of the society. And finally, that a certain uh, kind of activism compromises serious research, in quotation marks. Um, if we look at the uh, uh, comparison of West versus Ukraine, we see that there are progressive media in the West um, that try to push for more evidence-based uh, journalism and evidence-based policymaking. So in the, in the West in particular, this is the, the uh, box, for instance, or the monkey cage. Joshua Tucker was one of the, actually, um, <laughs> too, too bad he left. He would be able to tell probably more about this. Um, if we talk about Ukraine, we have to deal with the Soviet legacy. And uh, I'm going to be emphasizing this later, but also a general crisis of society, state, and the academia. Um, if we look at uh, generally rational discussion versus policymaking, we have to understand that um, integration uh, in a scholarly research into a policymaking process in the West uh, includes certain institutes such as think tanks, research facilities, uh, policy advisors to the government, senior scholars who no longer feel threatened by uh, engaging uh, more publicly in, in this kind of um, activism. Um, Public debate usually is sparked by political events, and ideally there, is, there should be a competition or there is a competition of best known practices and outreach to the scholars by political actors. Uh, finally, if we talk about rational debate, the rational debate, um, the idea is that reliance on research is especially important in, in those cases where uh, we have a discussion of contentious and taboo issues. Um, uh, so in the West, generally, we can attribute um, kind of the support for this rational debate to the heritage of or the legacy of uh, enlightenment. Um, this is opposed in Ukraine with the Soviet legacy that is um, mainly emotionally, that is kind of relies on emotionally driven arguments. Um, if we look at the Ukrainian reality, uh, we face significant obstacles for efforts to introduce rational and impartial debate of contentious issues. Uh, we also have this crisis in this uh, Ukrainian academia, 
which has to do with the fact that little socially uh, and policy relevant research is being produced. Uh, on the other hand, there's also a lack of interest from the political decision makers in such research. Um, what is also relevant is the very structure of the mainstream media. That is the fact that uh, most mainstream media are dominated by oligarchs, including currently by the Ukrainian president Poroshenko. Um, and they struggle for mass audience then later to utilize that, that access to, to the mass audience for their own political uh, goals. Um, finally, the result of all of that is um, a strong marginalization of independent intellectual media. They are unable usually to secure long-term funding. And I'm, I speak from experience trying to fundraise for Kritika. Um, now, if we, if we talk about the enduring legacy of the Soviet Union in Ukraine, um, some of the kind of important points in that is the perpetuation of emo emotional argumentation and ad hominem attacks, which are usually perceived as the standard. So no one actually questions that. Only, only uh, in a very few ca cases, people actually question that. Um, there is also a kind of other framework situation that is going on. So first of all, a massive impoverishment of, of all strata of the Ukrainian society, but especially those citizens who are engaged in, to, in intellectual activity. Um, there is also a significant reduction in the number of critical reading audience. Um, it also has to do with a general dramatic decline in reading as activity in Ukraine. Um, we also... Um, we also have to deal with the fact that the Ukrainian form of capitalism favors usually monopo monopolis, monop monopolies, right, and offers very little space uh, for independent and anti-establishment initiatives, especially in the media. Um, if we look at just recent changes, there, there are some positive developments, uh, but the, the change is usually hesitant and slow. Uh, there's also continuous reliance on generalists, so-called experts, but usually they do not specialize uh, in the topic of discussion. So they're usually tapped for everything. Uh, there is also a, a rather slow integration of policy-relevant research. Uh, some pioneers include Kritika, but also re uh, recently Vox Ukraine and Hromatska, both radio and TV. Uh, what are the main obstacles in introducing um, a rational kind of matter-of-fact debate? Uh, first of all, it's this strong sense of compartmentalization of debate. So scholars and public in in intellectuals, they uh, often avoid engaging each other in the, so in, in the debate. What it means is usually they do not, they kind of talk past each other, not to each other. What happens, what it means is that they avoid quotation of their colleagues, they avoid uh, confronting them in a matter-of-fact way. Um, and the kind of the other big problem is, of course, fundraising. What happens is that um, uh, external donors, donors are more responsive to requests for support. But we have to um, see that over the past four or five years, um, external funding uh, from EU, from US, and other organizations uh, for Ukraine and Ukrainian civil society has actually dramatically fallen. And you can look at numbers and you will see how dramatic that fall is. Um, now, talking about Kritika, just um, kind of briefly, the, the journal was uh, founded in 1997 by George Karbovich of Harvard University, Mikola Revchuk, Sulmia Pavlichko, and others. And later, uh, the editorial uh, board uh, joined also uh, Yuri Andruhovich, Yurko Prochasko, Serhii Plohi, and, and many others. And the idea is to model it on the New York view of books and Jerzy Gedritz's Kultura uh, Journal. Uh, the main goal was to counteract Soviet heritage, including institutional, and uh, to promote rational debate, address difficult or taboo topics. What kind of discussions were held since then? And this, by discussion, I mean usually publication of articles that try to engage each other, right, and kind of get to the bottom of things. So uh, discussions on national mystifications, on historical memory, Ukrainian identity, Soviet nostalgia, xenophobia, homophobia, anti-Semitism, Holodomor, Volinian massacre of 1943, the Iran nuclear deal, decommunization, fear of Stepan Bandera, and many others. These are topics that no one else touches in Ukraine because they're considered poisonous. Um, now, if looking at the goals, um, the idea is that we need to build a movement that pushes for rational discussion and evidence-based policy making. That we need to focus our efforts on educating broad public on the value and the need for such discussion. 
uh, finally, to give voice to Ukrainian scholars in discussions concerning Ukrainian issues, to engage both foreign and domestic partners, that is, in successful entrepreneurs who, are, who have not been engaged in some shady activities, in working together on developing such, such a society. Um, I'm going to skip why, I think it's <laughs> clear. Now, um, um, what the, kind of what really marks the public debate in Ukraine is underrepresentation of moderate positions that seek some sort of middle ground and social consensus on contentious issues. Furthermore, uh, what happens very often when Western uh, uh, scholars participate is that they try to instrumentalize Ukrainian issues for their own agendas, and usually those agendas have very little to do with Ukraine. And finally, there is generally a very low global presence of uh, Ukrainian scholars in debates that where they actually could contribute something valuable. And so the most recent one, of course, was the nuclear debate, which we successfully organized. Um, two examples. One is the Stepan Bandera discussion of 2010, and the other one is the most recent one of uh, the decommunization debate. So in the discussion, the, the all kind of broad views were represented. Timothy Snyder, John Paul Himka, Anatoly Rusnachenko, Andriy Portnov, and many others. Um, however, uh, the reaction to the Ukrainian society was negative, so it was seen as hair splitting, uh, that little relevant, uh, and it was also rejected on the grounds of ideology. Um, the Ukrainian academia was energized by this discussion, and it actually um, provided um, incentives for more research and publications. Um, similarly, also in, in the Western academia of specialists, those who were actually uh, interested in this, uh, but also part of it rejected. And in the end, what happened also, Kritika was slammed for organizing this discussion. Um, uh, for instance, just like a couple of quotes, um, we were slammed for a neutrality to fascism and genocide, for instance, or equating myth-making with academic inquiry or uh, defending apologetics of, uh, for fascists and war criminals. And you can see what kind of discourse this, this engages. And the, finally, the uh, kind of the last, uh, the recent de decommunization debate, and I always put it in quotation marks because the debate, I think, emphasized the need for desovietization. It means like in-depth institutional change, not just the change of, uh, you know, kind of communist practices that were never fully realized in Ukraine. So it started with publishing an open letter uh, of Western scholars to Poroshenko and, and Speaker of the Verkhovna Rada Hroisman, which uh, uh, had a huge resonance in Ukrainian media and society, followed by outrage on the part of nationalist uh, circles and patriotically minded uh, scholars and activities, in response to which we invited everyone to an open debate. As a result, our website was attacked and uh, we were shut down basically. The Ukrainian version was incapacitated for a prolonged period of time. And um, what happened then, also that prominent scholars, kind of the, decision, the uh, shakers of opinion, they refused to participate in or, or participated very reluctantly uh, because they perceived this as a lose-lose situation because it was so ideologically charged. Uh, we kind of experienced a clash of two camps of scholars and activisms, of, uh, both, and both of them uh, were characterized by basically bringing moral aspects, moral arguments, not a matter-of-fact debate of the issue. So the proponents of, of the law, they kind of, so the one camp said that the proponents of the law legitimized the activities of national organizations of the past, so OUN in particular, and downplayed their war crimes and crimes against humanity. Again, the, such an approach in their view was morally untenable. And then the second group pushed back against this interpretation and evoked also moral argumentation, saying that crimes of the communist regime in Ukraine cannot be uh, tolerated and uh, Ukraine has the right to define its politics of memory. So in, in the end, what we witness is that um, moderate, moderate views were marginalized in this debate, even though they were also published. Uh, what happened, for, so for instance, rejection of the law, but support for the cause itself, right? Lack of sensitivity of those in the West who are supposed to be experts on Ukraine, but don't see these complex uh, issues, um, and also, some other, some other, which you can, which you can uh, see on the slide. And finally, again, <laughs> Kritika was slammed for providing forum for this debate, and um, kind of accused of both parties of those kind of uh, antagon antagonistic uh, camps for favoring uh, the views of the opposite camp, bringing again moral arguments. Thank you very much.